Good morning, everybody, and thank you for coming today. I appreciate you all being here, and I'm always happy to be here, too. So uh, we're going to talk about the hurricane of 1938 today. Um, so uh, for those of you who don't know, um, I work at Historic New England. Everybody, anybody familiar? Historic New England, we're the country's largest regional preservation organization. I think that my colleague Ken Torino was here recently, uh, which is great, too. Uh, we have 38 properties across the five New England states that we maintain, uh, as well as all types of other programs. So uh, it kind of, I'm telling you this because it kind of plays a little bit into how this information that supports this lecture got to historic New England. So 2022 is going to be the 84th, I believe, anniversary of the Great Hurricane of 1938, or was. Uh, and nine years ago, uh, in, let's see if I'm on the right slide here. Oh, here we go. Uh, nine years ago, on uh, Historic New England received a scrapbook. Oh, that's okay. I, I can keep talking and no problem. Okay. Uh, Okay, well, I'll, we'll start over again. So uh, 2022 is going to be the 84th anniversary, or was the 84th anniversary, of this hurricane. And in nine years ago, in 2013, uh, an unsolicited donation arrived at our headquarters at Historic New England. And it was a scrapbook filled with images of the hurricane. So uh, there was a note included that said that the woman who mailed it found this in her mother's house and uh, up in the attic. And she didn't really know what to do with it or know if it was any value, so she decided, well, maybe Historic New England would want it. And she was right, because one of the things that Historic New England does is not just preserve history, but it's the stories of history. So when we go through this lecture today, a lot of the images that you see are going to be from this family scrapbook. This is one family's kind of perspective. We could talk about this hurricane for a month, right, with all kinds of images. And I know I'm hoping that uh, you'll all be able to stick around for a minute. I think Faye Salt may be willing to share. She's brought in some images. Somebody else said they have movies of this hurricane that were taken by their family. Uh, but you have to kind of narrow it down, right? So uh, this is based on this scrapbook that was given to historic New England. And uh, we're going to see why this hurricane was so unique, right? There's been many hurricanes since. Uh, but one of the things that we're going to see over and over again, and I mentioned earlier before we were kind of up and live, that this is not the happiest of stories. It's very interesting. But what we're going to find over and over again, that this hurricane did not discriminate. It didn't matter if you were rich, if you were poor, if you were young, if you were old. This hit everybody. And we're going to see that over and over again. So uh, the people who lived through it, We'll never, never forget it. And I know that there are stories that have been passed on. And I encourage that today at any time. If anybody has any stories they want to share uh, through experiences or family experiences or passed down stories, that's always a high point for me because it always likes, I like to hear that human side of it, right, from uh, people who actually uh, either experienced it or had friends or family that did experience it. So I'm going to go back to the slide for a moment. And this should all look very familiar to you, right? When you watch the news every day, you see things like this all the time. You see the weather maps. You see uh, this is a situation overview of a past hurricane. And this is the weather forecast office sends out impacts and location uh, on hurricane. This was Hurricane Dorian, which was years ago. Um, but the reason that I start with this is because 
we take so much for granted these days in terms of what we have and what we have access to. And even though, as we were discussing a few minutes ago, they're not always correct, at least there's some sense that there's something coming. And that's really integral to understanding why this hurricane was such a disaster, because none of this technology existed at the time in 1938. So let's go back to 1938, uh, if you'll travel with me. And uh, here's some things that were happening in the United States that year. Uh, you can see them on the screen behind me here, but uh, there's an author uh, named R.A. Uh, Scotty who notes in her book, Sudden Sea, the Great Hurricane of 1938, and this is a quote, there were no freeways, no frozen or fast food, and no supermarkets. Ballpoint pens, nylon stockings, and the 40-hour work week were just coming in. Night ball games were a novelty, and air conditioning a rarity. Uh, one in four workers was unemployed at the time, and 1938 was the last full season that Lou Gehrig would play. Uh, in really big news, Hitler was threatening to march into Czechoslovakia, and Spain was in the third year of its civil war, and the radio was really the centerpiece in just about every family home. So the summer in 1938 in New England wasn't a great one weather-wise to begin with. There was record rain in June and July and record heat in August. So we're kind of setting the stage for what was going to make things even worse. September brought the wet weather back and it rained for four days straight leading up to the hurricane. So the effect that this is going to have, as you can imagine, is the ground was already soaked. And we're going to see over and over again how the wind, the rain, all that was terrible, but the flooding in New England is what caused a lot of the damage too. Um, so the day before the hurricane, many parts of New England uh, got drenched with five to six inches of rain. However, on the day of the hurricane, which was September 21st, it started off mild, even a nice day, and this also plays into, as we're going to see, a lot of the disasters that happened too. The sun was actually out that morning, and looking back on it, people almost felt that it was almost too perfect, they had reported, that it just seemed weird that the weather was this nice uh, on the morning of something that was going to follow thereafter. There was a strange stillness in the air, uh, and quite a few people on the southern New England coast were spending the morning outside, right? It was this beautiful day picnicking and even enjoying maybe a last fall day on the beach for the year with no idea of what was coming down the road. So hurricanes uh, that hit the eastern United States begin with their cluster of clouds, and this is Hurricane Floyd, obviously. We don't have any pictures of the 1938 hurricane, uh, but begin with the cluster of clouds uh, in tropical seas off of northwestern Africa. They need very specific conditions. So uh, again, I'm not a hurricane expert, but I have learned quite a bit about from doing this lecture, and it amazes me how specific those conditions actually need to be. Um, the water has to be at least 200 feet deep or the hurricane won't form. The water surface temperature has to be just around 80 degrees Fahrenheit or the hurricane won't form. The cluster of clouds needs to be close to the equator but not too close or the hurricane won't form. And there needs to be the right planetary spin, warm wet air and interrupted, uninterrupted seas with no island or volcanic mountains to slow the cluster down. So it's amazing that they ever form at all based on that they need such specific conditions, but they do. So in the case of the 1938 hurricane, just a few weeks earlier on September 4th, a French meteorologist in the Sahara noted that winds were moving towards the Atlantic Ocean. So the first signs of this uh, started on September 4th. Two weeks later, this wind system, now a hurricane force, was spotted northwest over Puerto Rico. On September 16th, the Jacksonville office of the National Weather Bureau, which we're going to learn a little more about in a little bit, uh, tracked the hurricane because of a weather report coming from a Brazilian freighter that described rough seas, 75 mile per hour winds, and barometric pressures that seemed to be uh, way off and falling. So someone had said earlier a little bit about that. Uh, things were reported by ships, and we're going to see again and again that uh, this is the type of technology that people were relying on, right? We have a report from the Sahara Desert, and we have a ship off the coast of Brazil, and that's where they're getting their information. So at full strength, a hurricane is a low-pressure system that increases, uh, releases more energy in one day than the U.S. consumes in electric power in six months. 
So again, we're going to have some, uh, and one of the reasons, I don't normally like to talk from notes, but there's so many numbers in this that I don't want to get anything wrong. Uh, but we're going to see how, just how powerful this hurricane really was. And uh, those were tracking the storm in Jacksonville, Florida at the time where there was an office of the Weather Bureau felt that there was a very strong possibility that this storm was going to hit southern Florida. So in 1935, uh, there was a couple years earlier, the great Labor Day hurricane hit Florida, killing over 400 people. Uh, and the Jacksonville office wanted to do everything it could to make sure that this disaster was not going to happen again. So on Monday, September 19th, 1938, it looked as if the storm was going to hit Florida as a Category 5. A hurricane warning was issued and emergency services were put in place. But by Tuesday morning, it was clear that that hurricane was not going to hit Florida. So after sending warning to the Carolinas, the Jacksonville office of the National Weather Bureau passed responsibility for, making, uh, on to, for tracking the storm to Washington, D.C. So the system was moving north, and meteorologists felt that it would take the path of most hurricanes in that area. It would move northward over the Atlantic Ocean, where it would diminish, and then the wind would eventually die down. Okay, Don't let's see. Why. It's this one. Let's just, we're gonna switch. Is it off? It looks like it did Yeah, I don't know. I told you I had a big mouth, right? You could still hear me. Are we, is it back? Back on? Yeah, okay, okay, okay. No problem, I delivered on my promise of a big mouth, right? So that's good. Okay, uh, so the National Weather Bureau, right, which plays is, is uh, let's call it, I don't want to call them a villain in this story, but uh, the National Weather Bureau was originally chartered in 1870 by an act of Congress, but it was not to track weather. Anybody know what the National Weather Bureau originally was designed for? Lighthouses. Lighthouses, maybe commerce. Right? They were, it was about tr commerce, it was about shipping, and it was uh, basically to, to track all that type of weather for that. So 20 years later, it became a civilian agency, and power would transfer to the Department of Agriculture. By 1935, there was a central office in Washington, D.C., and forecasting branches in Jacksonville, as we heard about a minute ago, New Orleans, and San Juan, Puerto Rico. So meteorologists relied on volunteers to report data. Right? So they were basically like that ship, uh, that, that meteorologist that was in, uh, in the Sahara. These were volunteers. Uh, at the time, there were no scientists on staff at all and no formal training procedures. They relied on observations, which we heard about. Okay, get ready for this. Here's some more numbers for you. The 16th century thermometer, right, they were still using. The 17th century mercurial barometer and weather vanes. Right? That's what they were using to predict these, these hurricanes. So when it came to the 1938 hurricane, the story has often been told of a junior forecaster in the Washington, D.C. office named Charlie Pierce. Now, Charlie Pierce was relatively new when he was young, uh, but he basically had told the rest of the meteorologists or the, the people at the National Weather Bureau that this hurricane was not going in the direction that everybody thought it was going to go. And because he was young, because he was a junior member of this team, they all basically pushed him aside and said, you need to stop talking about that. We know where the hurricane's going. We know better than you. Well, we're going to see it turned out that Charlie Pierce was exactly right. Okay, so hurricane pass. So there were a few warning signs uh, that should have told the, those forecasters what storm this was going to take, even without the instruments that they had. But a ship off the northwest coast of Virginia reported a barometric reading, uh, which was extremely low, which indicated that the storm was much closer to the coast than they believed at the time. There was a low pressure hovering over the Allegheny Mountains, which turned northward this way. So you can see on the top up there, you've got a, one pressure system coming that way. Uh, there was a, uh, also a high pressure system over the North Atlantic. So you can see on the right-hand side of that upper slide, uh, you can see the winds going that way too. So basically the storm, when all these things came together, as you can see in this lower slide, had nowhere to go but up straight through New England. 
right? It was basically just kind of pressured into this very narrow path. Uh, so all this was basically should have been indications that something was not quite right. So here is the hurricane path of 1938. And all those signs that we just saw kind of indicated that this storm was going to go through New England. But why didn't the forecasters believe, even all these, they had these signs and these warnings from Charlie Pierce, that the storm would hit New England? So besides their lack of meteorological tools, which we know they didn't have, it was common belief that hurricanes just didn't hit where? New England, right? No, a hurricane would never hit New England, right? But nobody alive in 1938 had lived through either of the last two hurricanes to hit the area. One was in August of 1635. I hope nobody was alive in 1938, right? And the other was the Great Gale in 1815. So those hurricanes were not imprinted on anybody's memory at the time. The storm of 1815 wiped out all the trees that once densely forested uh, Napa Tree, Rhode Island, and flooded Providence. It was eerily similar to what was about to happen in 1938. And again, to quote R.A. Scotty again in, in her book, most hurricanes have three weapons, wind, rain, and waves. This hurricane had a fourth, surprise. And that's really what's going to cause a lot of the damage here. OK, so in Boston on the morning of September 21st, you would have been reading, if you were looking at the paper, that James Michael Curley won the Democratic primary for governor, the Sox beating the St. Louis Browns in a doubleheader sweep, and again, Hitler's annexation, annexation of the Sudetenland, right? the wars happening in Europe. All right, I think this might be my favorite slide. So the day the hurricane hit Northeast, the New York Times printed an editorial on page 27 praising the National Weather Bureau for the work they did keeping Florida up to date with that storm. <laughs> Has to be one of the worst timed editorials ever, right? So uh, the hurricane of 38 just didn't affect southern New England. It also affected New York, as we're going to see. And uh, by mid-morning, New Jersey Shore uh, was feeling the effects. So uh, really, uh, I, I guess, a very ill-timed editorial but uh, a good lesson, right, when we talk about them still getting the weather wrong. Okay, so the hurricane is gonna hit New York first, and it hit New York City, and it got the western edge of the storm, so there was flooding, there were blackouts, there were trees down and some damaged buildings. Uh, it halted the US Open semifinals. The Empire State Building actually swayed four inches. That's how strong the winds were in New York, and they're going to get a lot worse, as we're going to see. But the storm's eye really passed over Long Island, which got hit worse. Uh, and the winds of a northbound hurricane are strongest to the east. So communities to the east of the storm's eye were hit the hardest. And that meant the southeastern shore of Long Island uh, would get hit the hardest. So by 2 p.m., right, this is, uh, we're starting basically around noon. And by 2 p.m., it was very clear that this was much bigger than anybody was thinking. So uh, we will see what happens next. So at 2.30 p.m. now, and you're going to start to see these images, again, a lot from the scrapbook. Uh, and you can imagine, even before I get into the details of this, the force of what it takes to throw a train off tracks like that. But at 2.30, the storm came ashore. And no more than 45 minutes later, uh, it was hitting Long Island with really, really strong power. Besides suffering from heavy wind and rain, uh, the southern tip of Long Island was devastated by storm surges. Now, most people, uh, we talked earlier a little bit about went outside because the day started very nice. There were people on the beaches when this thing started coming. So a lot of people went out to see what was going on. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, a lot of those people lost their lives because this thing hit so fast that they were basically went down to the beach to see what was going on. And the storm surges came in so quickly that they were washed out to sea. So damage from the hurricane, we talked about, comes in three ways, flooding, strong winds, and storm surges. And storm surges, uh, I know it sounds pretty obvious, but they occur because the wind hits the water with such force. If you can imagine, when waves crash on the beach, they flow in and then they ebb back out again. Well, when the wind is blowing that strong, there's only inward movement, right? It never has the opportunity to recede again. So that's what causes these storm surges. And they create walls of tens of thousands of tons of water that crash onto shore. So storm surges alone account for three quarters of most hurricane deaths. And another number for you, the density and force of water is a thousand times more powerful than the force of air. So if you can imagine how strong those winds were, you can imagine how strong these crashing waves were. 
All right, so here is West Hampton getting hit by winds of 100 miles per hour or more uh, and caused measurable tremors to be heard. So this, these uh, waves were pounding so hard on the earth in New York that they actually recorded measurements in Alaska of tremors. That's how far it went. It went across the whole continent. It was so strong, if you can believe that or not. So uh, the, uh, we're, we're, the storm, as the storm goes here, uh, the eye of the storm actually brought calm for about 20 minutes. And people began to leave shelters thinking that it had passed. Uh, but as we can see, when you go through an eye of a hurricane, things are going to start going back up again. OK, here's West Hampton again. Uh, so it came up the eastern shore here at about 50 to 70 miles per hour. And no hurricane had ever moved that fast. So it's not the wind that's moving 50 to 75 miles an hour. It's the whole hurricane is moving that fast. So if you can imagine driving along the highway at 60 miles an hour, that's how fast the storm is actually moving. So beach communities where people had enjoyed lunch that day uh, no longer existed by dinner time. By 5.30 p.m., the hurricane was pulling off Long Island, leaving in its wake incredible devastation, as you can see behind us here, and earning its nickname, the Long Island Express. So as it left Long Island, the storm, as we might want to say, started banging on New England's door almost as soon as it reached New York. So this hurricane, again, had a span of over 500 miles wide. Right, that's the swath, that's the width of this storm. And on average, most hurricanes are about 300. So this was an especially broad reaching hurricane. All right, so the storm is moving up into Connecticut and here we see flooding in Bridgeport. Uh, it was hit hard, but New York City, they still didn't feel the full weight of the storm. So look, if you can kind of get a precursor of what's coming down the line, this isn't the, the, the worst of the damage yet. Uh, but once again, it was the southeastern part of the state that got hit by the storm the worst. So communities between Saybrook Point and Stonington had massive damage. Anybody from Connecticut? No Connecticuters, okay. All right, so here's some images from New London. And again, these a lot come from scrapbook. And so some of the images are a little bit fuzzy because they're old newspaper print. But I think you can get the idea of what's going on here. Uh, New London was the first city to really experience the full force of the hurricane. It struck the city at about 3 p.m. and stayed for about three hours. Right? So we're at 3 p.m. these days, so I just want to take a moment. This is all happening in one day. That's how fast this is going on, which I think is important to keep in mind. So in addition to the wind, rain, and the storm surges that we talked about, New London, like so many communities, had to cope with inland rivers flooding, which we're going to see as another major problem. And if that weren't enough, the five-masted uh, barkentine blew out of the water, crossed the railroad tracks, and hit the corner of what is known as the Humphrey Cornell Building. Uh, and with all these water, these ships basically blowing on shore and rivers flooding, wires coming down, a massive fire began to spread on top of everything else. So here we can see New London burning. And uh, the fire was reported to the fire department at about 4.30 p.m. And it was really a terrible situation for these firefighters because the wind was spreading the fire so fast. The city was basically flooded. Uh, trees were down, buildings were down. So it was very, very difficult uh, and almost impossible for them to control this fire. So even with every able-bodied person, uh, the Coast Guard and the fire department of neighbor towns assisting, it was 2 a.m. before the fire was completely uh, contained. And for the next week, the entire city had enforced curfew uh, of 8 p.m. A month later, and I'm going to do another quote here, the New London Day reported, as the storm, uh, after the storm, this city, more than anything else, resembled a large community in a war zone, which had just undergone a terrific shelling by big guns of the enemy. Trees, poles, walls, roofs, chimneys, and homes were shattered and demolished. Mm -hmm. Vessels of all sizes and descriptions were hurled to destruction or sunk. Wharves were leveled seawalls torn away, roads and sidewalks undermined, entire summer colonies destroyed, and great gaps torn in the earth, inland as well as along the shorefront. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. In this case, I think the words might be worth as much as the picture. Okay, 
Here's a familiar face, right? And a couple of you had alluded to Katherine Hepburn before. So famously, uh, Katherine Hepburn was in her Connecticut home and experienced uh, this hurricane. So uh, it was in Fenwick, Connecticut, that the family had a house. And that's located uh, where Long Island Sound meets the mouth of the Connecticut River. So her career was in a little bit of a slump, and she was waiting at home to see if she had run the, won the role of Scarlett O'Hara in Gone with the Wind. Right? We know that didn't happen. So uh, she was, however, reading the final draft of a new play called The Philadelphia Story. We know that did go well for her, right? So she spent the morning of the 21st swimming and playing golf. Uh, if anybody knows anything about Katherine Hepburn's history, she was always very active. And she was getting out of the ocean uh, in the afternoon when the storm came upon her and her house. And by the time she reached the house, as she recalled, uh, the ocean was already coming onto the lawn and the wind was, uh, she was able to hold herself upright in the wind. So this is the uh, post-hurricane house, but this is the site. You can kind of get a sense of what the, the setting was like when she happened. So uh, she recalled that the house quickly began tearing apart, chimneys collapsing, screens and windows blowing away, and the whole laundry ring was pulled away from the building. Uh, she was there with a mother and a brother and a family friend, and they tied themselves together with rope as the water was pouring in the house. They escaped through a dining room window, and when they got to the higher ground, and saw their house sailing away. Catherine Hepburn said that, and she quoted herself, and I can think you can all hear her saying this. I don't want to do a terrible Catherine Hepburn impression, but she said that she saw the house sail away in such a dignified manner, right? <laughs> that sounds just like her, I think. So all of their possessions were gone, carried away by the water, and uh, the next day as they were going through the rubble, they found a few remnants of things that they saved, but uh, this was the house that was rebuilt by the Hepburns after the hurricane. So Old Saybrook, uh, houses were thrown off their foundations, uh, as you can see here. Uh, we're still in Connecticut. Lime, uh, similarly devastated, as you can see from these images. Railroad tracks were basically twisted and thrown off their beds. Boats were thrown onto the shore. Telephone and electric lines were destroyed. So one of the most famous stories to come out of this hurricane was the Bostonian. And the Bostonian was a train that went from Grand Central Station in New York to Boston. Well, we followed the path of this hurricane from so far from New York going up to New England. So you, what's basically going to happen is you're going to see is this train was following the same path uh, as the hurricane. So it was headed uh, for Boston with three stops in Connecticut, three in Rhode Island, and then uh, arriving in Back Bay Station. And the train, as you can imagine, uh, was filled with many students in September returning to school. Uh, by the time the train left the station in New Haven, Connecticut, the engineers and others had reported that there was something uh, amiss with the weather. So when the train left the New London station at 4 o'clock, forceful winds uh, had engulfed the train. And it kept going along a narrow causeway built on gravel that had already been weakened by all that rain that leading up to the day of the hurricane. So they were already uh, crossing a, a causeway that was in a compromised situation. So if you can imagine, and you're going to see another picture in a minute, but they're basically on this spit of land between two bodies of water and uh, the sea rising on one side and a salt pond on the other. And the Pullman cars, which weighed 67 tons, were swaying back and forth on both sides as the water was getting higher and higher. But most passengers didn't, getting, didn't get truly alarmed until the windows began shattering, and the conductor went through each cabin asking passengers uh, to sit on the inland side of the train. So you can see the way the train was leaning. They were trying to get everybody on the other side of the train. Uh, but the big problem wasn't the windows. It was in fact that the rail, rail, rail bed was disappearing underneath the train. So this gravel was basically sinking into the water. So by 4.30 p.m., the parlor car only had its front wheels on the track. There were no rails, ties, or anything beneath it. And the staff decided that the best course of action was just to uh, get everybody up to the front cars instead of waiting for water to push the train over. So some people began deserting the train, jumping out of the windows, trying to get to safety, leaping into the water. 
Uh, the crew squeezed as many people as they could into the engine car as possible, and the rest stayed in the front car. And those who ended up in the water, as you can imagine, had to deal with terrifying undertow that dragged many of them down to their deaths, sadly, as well as pieces of debris, boats, houses, everything else uh, floating around in the water. So this gives you a good sense of what was going on with the Bostonian. You can get a sense of why they were trying to get people from these rear cars up to the front here. Uh, and there was a brakeman, uh, a hero in this story, named Bill Donahue, who actually dove into the water in the storm to shut off the compressors and uncouple those rear cars of the train so the rest of the train could basically continue to move forward and get off of this causeway. Bill lived, yeah, the, he lived. All right, so on to Hartford. Uh, so even beyond the coast, right, because as we know, Hartford is not on the coast, towns were devastated, uh, mostly due to flooding, as you can see here. Connecticut had flood issues even before the hurricane hit. When the storm only dropped, the storm only dropped three inches of rain on Hartford, the winds caused the rivers and the basins to overflow as well. So that was contributing to the flooding. Uh, and again, that rain before the hurricane, uh, the days leading up to it, meant that existing moist conditions of the soil, the water had nowhere to go except to stay on the surface. So all the rivers, the Housatonic, uh, the Thames, the Connecticut, and the Naugatuck rivers all wreaked havoc on the town of Hartford. Hundred-year-old trees and already drenched soil uh, just crashed over like they weighed nothing uh, into cars and buildings. And this was around 4 p.m. now in the afternoon. Okay, some more images of Hartford. So by midnight, the Connecticut River reached 24 feet high and boats were needed to patrol the city. 7,000 people had to be evacuated out of their homes. Two days later, the water finally began to recede. And I, this is written into this lecture and it's kind of funny, but you know, I don't like to make fun of, of any disaster, but uh, at the time, the people in Hartford, very little flood insurance. Right? I know Hartford is known for its insurance, but uh, it, very, very few people had flood insurance right at this time in Hartford. So um, trees, apple orchards, and other crops, the tobacco fields, everything destroyed. So uh, a little broader view of Connecticut. Factories were ripped open. You can see the damage here. Churches were torn in pieces. Uh, the local dam gave way. Uh, you know, I read these things on and on, it's almost what else can go wrong, right? And there always seems to be more. So uh, following the hurricane, as you can imagine, there was no fresh water for anybody. People were having to boil water to safely drink water. Uh, people were receiving emergency inoculations. And people were in the dark. Remember, all this is happening and the power's gone. So every, all this is happening in blackness. So in Stonington, um, you can already see one deadly aspect of this storm. Uh, no one hit by it could warn any other communities because of the massive uh, blackouts that were happening. So the storm left a very dark path in its wake. Uh, every time one town was hit, the town went into blackness. They couldn't communicate to the next town that this was coming. Telegraph and phone lines were obviously destroyed. Power outages were everywhere. So um, Rhode Island, which is coming next on the map, right in the path of the hurricane, all this had already happened in Connecticut and New York, and Rhode Island really had no idea what was coming. So the size and geography of Rhode Island kind of makes it a perfect hurricane target, as we're going to see. Uh, and Rhode Island really got overwhelmed more than any other state. So Narragansett Bay is the largest bay in New England, 30 miles long and two to three miles wide, depending on where you are. And at its head is Providence, as you can see, up at the top. And Jamestown and Newport are, are up along the way. So in between Narragansett Bay and Little Narragansett Bay, which is right on the Connecticut, Rhode Island state line, is South County and Barrier Beach with lots of coastal towns. So again, water or anything, wind takes the path of least resistance. So you see here, it's got a perfect place to go. So Narragansett, um, these coastal towns in Rhode Island were really the ones that were the most devastated, uh, being completely wiped out, never to be seen again. So this is a picture before the hurricane. 
Um, so barrier beaches, you see uh, there's all these little spits of land. You can see along here these little type islands land where people had built summer homes. So there are these long, low-lying, narrow strips of land that run usually parallel to the mainland, as we see here, and are separated by a body of water, as we see here. So during a hurricane, from a natural standpoint, they form a little bit of a buffer between the ocean and the mainland, but in doing so, those little spits of land become a killing field, right? Because normally they're not meant to be inhabited by people with summer homes. So they do serve as a buffer, but it also is, if you can think about the houses, is maybe a first line of defense. So uh, one of the th other things that happened is that this also hit during high tide, which made things even more disastrous. And uh, also at uh, the autumnal equinox, where the gravitational pull is at its fullest. So again, all these circumstances adding to the hurricane effect that's making it worse than it normally would have been. So when water surged onto these beaches, it was unable to retreat, as we saw, and simply retained its grip on these, on these uh, residents here. So again, uh, it's, we tend to lose sight of, by, in the morning, people were out on the beach having a picnic. By this time, everything was gone. So uh, no amount of anything that anybody could have done could have saved any of these houses that were out on uh, like Watch Hill and Napa Tree Point. So by 4.30, uh, you can see uh, westerly Rhode Island was overrun with water and the wind was throwing around houses and everything else, cars. And looking back, cyber, survivors often commented that the sound of the storm was all consuming, a whiny, high-pitched sound. And I, I always stop on that for a moment because, you know, we see things visually and we kind of sense like the wind, but people don't think about sound when it comes to these historical events. And the sounds of this hurricane, based on eyewitnesses, must have been so deafening and so overwhelming that uh, I think it's, it's easy to forget just how terrifying that might have been. So uh, people, because of the wind of the hurricane, they couldn't necessarily hear any of the destruction that was going around. They couldn't hear these buildings uh, crumbling. So no one will ever know the real speeds of the winds by the time it hit here because the instruments that we talked about earlier were destroyed during the hurricane. So the Blue Hills Observatory, um, before it blew, recorded sustained winds of 121 miles an hour and gusts of up to 186 miles per hour, but then it broke. So the highest ever recorded was 186. So many people in their homes, uh, and again, uh, this is a, this is a little, this is human aspect to this story. So many people were in their homes, raced up to their floors to escape the water. And one survivor, and this is another little anecdote that I love, was a child who remember thinking that her father was trying to keep the front door, not just trying to keep the front door shut, but was trying to keep the ocean out. And I think from a child's perspective, it's always interesting to see because adult would have a very perspect different perspective of this hurricane than a child would. Uh, so others were not so lucky to survive, thinking they might be out for the night, uh, out of their homes. Many people dressed in layers and layers to flee their houses and then ended up in the water. And if you have a lot of clothing on and you end up wet, we know what happens. It just pulls you down. So unfortunately, uh, several people lost their lives that way as well. So many people would later comment that the speed of the destruction was incredible. Remember, this is moving through at 60 miles an hour. And one moment, people are laughing and having a good time on the beach. And the next minute, their houses were under 20 to 30 feet of water. So uh, here's a quote from the assistant fire chief in Miskamaquit that some of the houses, he said, just blew up like feathers. He saw boards leaping 75 feet up into the air and collapsing again before they hit the water. So, as we've talked about, this started off like any other day with no warning, but that meant that children were also off to school. Okay, so in Rhode Island, uh, at the entrance of Narragansett Bay, uh, parents usually let their children walk home to school when they went to pick them up, or went to pick them up. But uh, some of the kids relied on school buses to take them home. And the school bus left at 3 p.m., heading towards Beavertail, the southwest portion of the town. So you can see here where the schools are, and what's going to happen is you see this little neck of land right here going over towards Fox Hill Farm. That's where this bus, basically, in the story is going to end up, much like the train, the Bostonian. So uh, to get there from the northeast, again, they had to cross uh, what we see as Mackerel Cove. 
So by the time the bus reached that causeway, uh, it was being hit by fierce winds and sheets of rain, and visibility was impossible. Uh, and debris was floating in the bay, and waves were breaking over the road. So water was up to the hubcaps of the bus, and even the wind blowing 100 miles an hour, the bus driver felt it was better to take the kids out of the bus, right? So survivors and witnesses would talk later how the siblings looked after each other, helping one another out of the bus. There were witnesses on, on either side of this causeway that were not able to get out there and help. Uh, and eventually, uh, the school bus was uh, flung into the water, basically. So the, the children were developed, enveloped by the storm of water, pushed them uh, into the water, and uh, there was only two people survived that disaster, the bus driver and one 11-year-old uh, child, and volunteers searched for the rest of the children, all the techniques, but uh, the bodies were not found, sadly. So these, these stories are heartbreaking, right, a lot of them. I mean, and we kind of preface this by saying it's not necessarily a happy story. Um, but I, I think it's important to tell them to uh, kind of magnify the impact of this storm, right? So you can use some numbers here. And again, uh, 700 houses in Charlestown Beach were wiped out. Uh, 39 houses in Napa Tree Point. We're still in Rhode Island here. Uh, over 400 Rhode Islanders lost their lives, 175 from South County alone. Uh, but I think when doing this, it's all too easy to lose sight of the personal stories. Uh, and that is why uh, when the scrapbook, as we started, came to Historic New England, it meant a lot to Historic New England because it was a personal story. So in just a few hours, this hurricane created unimaginable scenes of terror for so many people. Uh, and almost all of Rhode Island was impacted by this storm, not just South County. So uh, I know we're more people familiar with Newport. Uh, so the Grand Cottages there uh, fared a little bit better for some reasons. Uh, they're in a little higher position there. They're not right on uh, at, at Providence. And uh, of course, there were very well-built buildings. So they had a little more uh, resolve to withstand those winds. But uh, rescue workers were still going from door to door. So here's the breakers. And again, a little bit of a fuzzy image. But uh, you can see, I think I have them circled here, right? So that is the breakers before the storm. And you can see basically the devastation in this after photo of how many trees were gone and how much of the land was actually cleared. So it ripped through Warwick, Rhode Island, leaving 100 people homeless. Um, oyster boats and all other types of vessels were basically hurled uh, onto main streets. Bristol, the hurricane uh, heavily damaged Bristol and uh, was cut off from the rest of the world for two days following the storm. There the water rose 15 feet above normal. And Providence, as we're going to see, was really the hardest hit. So by 4 p.m., the storm was raging full force in Providence. The city did receive a hurricane warming at 340, so they had 20 minutes to get ready for this. While the wind damage took its toll, uh, the majority of the damage was due to flooding, as we're going to see again and again. Now, downtown Providence, as we remember, was located at the top of Narragansett Bay on low ground, right by the water's edge. And the storm surges, as we talked about, really began to hit downtown Providence at 515. Well, if you recall, this was a normal day, right? So people had gone to work that day. So now, much like the kids leaving school at 3 p.m., people are leaving work at 5 p.m. when this starts to hit Providence. So electricity failed, cars, furniture, clothes, all of that could be found in the water. And many remembered, we talked about sound again, the eerie sound of the car horns and the lights underwater. Right, something you don't see very, very often, or at all, if at all, uh, and remembering how eerie that was. And again, this is all during rush hour when workers are trying to commute home. So the Providence Bulletin uh, re reflected, and again a quote here, no amount of repetitious description could possibly picture what the mind at first completely failed to grasp. A downtown Providence under raging water men diving from high signs on the sides of buildings, men swimming for their lives, all to the tune of screaming wind that tore with vicious fingers at tall buildings and shook the city to its very foundations. 
So there was a lot of reports of cooperation and courage that helped save a lot of lives in downtown Providence, people being pulled from the water. That being said, there were seven fatalities in downtown Providence. One man was swept into the turbulent water, and you can see how that could easily happen uh, in front of City Hall. So at the highest point, the water reached 14 feet high above the streets, and by 10 p.m., the water finally started to recede. So looters became a problem. Uh, groups of people descended on abandoned stores, and I'm sure I can imagine the panic of people thinking they're not going to have food, they're not going to have anything. So uh, people started descending on abandoned stores, uh, carrying out whatever they could, and by, uh, they had to call in the National Guard. And, uh, they also issued an order of shoot to kill. That's how bad it was. Uh, and Providence remained under martial law for two weeks following the hurricane. So it would be two weeks before things started to return to normal. All right, so we make our way into Massachusetts, and somebody had asked about the Cape earlier. So by 5 p.m., again, this is all happening in one day, uh, the wind started hitting Massachusetts from Horseneck Beach to Buzzards Bay. You can see the damage there at Buzzards Bay. Horseneck Beach had 30-foot high waves. The beach was swept clean. 23 people lost their lives in Westport. Another image of Westport. Here is East Beach before the hurricane. That's what was left after, right? So these before and afters are really telling sometimes, right, in terms of just how bad this destruction was. And when they say nothing was left, literally nothing was left. So here's uh, people living in this area were trapped by the incoming sea on one side and marshes on the other, much like the Bostonian train was. Factories were shut down in New Bedford, and 1,000 people in Fairhaven became homeless. I mean, people losing their homes, and where could you go, right? Everything else was gone as well. So out of 170 houses on Crescent Beach in Mattapoisett, only 10 would survive this fury. And 41 people in the Greater Fall River area lost their lives. Uh, and one of the things that we're going to talk about as we get a little further down the line is the New England landscape. So all these little fishing villages, we still see some of them around, but before this hurricane, there were many more of them. And these, poor, these little fishing shacks that were so iconically New England uh, were basically just blown away and smashed to bits. So uh, these coastal towns, even as we see them today, would have looked quite differently before 1938. Okay, well, here's Bourne at the Cape at the Bridge. And under the Sagamore Bridge, uh, as you can see, uh, three elderly women, a mother and her 11-year-old son, were trapped on the second floor of a house and sadly drowned and lost their lives. Uh, rescue workers had to cut a hole in the roof to retrieve the bodies. And the house was originally located two miles south of here. Right, so that house floated two miles down the river. Uh, the lower Cape was not close to the storm's eye. And that and the islands diminishing the hurricane's power helped spare some of the mass disruption here. The Cape Cod Canal also helped save a lot of Massachusetts coastline because, again, as we saw in a bad way, when it went up uh, to, to Providence uh, through the bay, it always takes the path of least resistance. So the, in this case, the Cape Cod Canal actually helped. All right, moving inland a little bit, here's some images from the Arnold Armory, Arboretum. So Boston got hit around 5 p.m. Uh, if you can imagine, uh, the USS Constitution, Old Ironsides, broke loose from its anchorage uh, and was floating out in, uh, in, in free water. Uh, display windows on Boylston and Tremont streets were smashed. The Arnold Arboretum lost 1,500 trees. Uh, the Boston Public Garden and Harvard Yard lost trees that had existed for centuries. Okay, a couple more images from the Boston area. Uh, Boston City Hospital, of course, was treating patients, uh, more than 300 with hurricane-related injuries. Uh, and a small fleet of fishing boats uh, in the North End was completely lost, never to be seen. Okay, so this is the Codman Estate, which is one of uh, historic New England's properties as it stands today. Uh, and you can see on these, even inland, this is in Lincoln. 
right? So even this far inland, you can see the devastation that was done uh, from the winds uh, to some of these houses here. And again, another historic New England property, the Lyman Estate as it stands today. Uh, but these, uh, you know, the Lymans, it's especially hard hitting here uh, because if you've been to the Lyman Estate, we also have the country's oldest greenhouses there. Uh, and they were very much into horticulture, so there was a lot of uh, very rare plants and species of trees being grown that were basically just lost to the hurricane. So it took weeks, if not months, to clean all this up, as you can imagine. And here we are in Springfield, Mass. Uh, so again here, when you get this far inland, uh, obviously you don't have the storm surges from the ocean, but you do have massive flooding to the rivers. So again, factories being closed down and destroyed, roads sunk, bridges completely wiped out. They were dropping in, uh, air dropping in food because there was no way to get to these towns. So, uh, you know, the electric company, the towers were basically destroyed and the storm isolated towns and the Berkshires for days. People just completely isolated. So where was cut off for five days? Much like Connecticut, uh, crops and livestock were almost a total loss. 3,000 trees alone in Amherst came down. Uh, the dam burst, 50 families rescued from their homes by boat, and the river 14 feet above normal. So again, flooding a huge problem. So New Hampshire had significant flooding as well due to uh, the rain and the wind damage. And in Peterborough, there was also a major fire, much like there was in New London. Uh, which burned down about four city blocks. Here's Lake Winnipesaukee, and here's another before and after for you. So this is a, uh, a spot on Lake Winnipesaukee before the hurricane. There's what was left after. So you can actually see the house that was behind all those trees there, but you can see again kind of the devastation. So the storm continues up to Vermont at 9 p.m., and it reaches Burlington, where again they had flood damage. Uh, it was far less powerful. The storm was losing some steam here, but it would continue on to Quebec and Montreal before it completely petered out altogether on September 22nd. So clearly towns in New England were continuing to battle what was in the aftermath of this. Uh, in upstate Connecticut, for example, the river did not recede until Friday, several days after. Downtown Providence flooded, Providence flooded again on Thursday as firemen were trying to pump water out from buildings. So most estimates are between six to 700 people died because of this hurricane. Uh, Maine was the only New England state with no fatality reported. Uh, there were over 1,700 injuries reported. And remember, this is happening when, we talked about at the very beginning, the country is still struggling with the Great Depression. 93,000 families suffered serious property damage. 63,000 left homeless. And again, only 5% of property loss was covered by insurance in 1938. Livestock disappeared, were killed. Tobacco production dropped hugely. Textile industry was completely destroyed. Fishing industry was devastated. So 88% uh, of the population lost power, and a quarter of all telephone service was knocked out. 175 churches alone were damaged. So, so regional, just this amazing disaster, right, that's really been lost to the pages in history, and we're going to see why. But half of all of New Hampshire, the pine industry was huge in New Hampshire. And uh, the lumber industry was hugely devastated as well. The US Forest Service estimated that enough lumber was felled to build 200,000 200, five room homes. So around New England, pieces popped up that were created from this wood. You can see here, here's a couple examples. Uh, the chair was made in Gardner, Massachusetts. And if you flip it over, you can see a pine souvenir from the hurricane of 1938. And this room is in northeastern Massachusetts, was constructed of 1938 hurricane pine. So, you know, we, we include these images. Uh, you know, we've talked about a lot of loss of life. But uh, what this really illustrates is that this hurricane had a lasting effect and really changed the look and towns and the way that people uh, perceive the New England landscape. I always say, too, that anytime you go into a thrift store or something and you see something made out of pine, flip it over, right, just to see. Okay. 
So, uh, so many things that were so iconic we talked about to historic New England were kind of lost forever, right? I mean, fishing boats were a, a major casualty, as you can see, and we've seen all along. Trees, uh, trees that existed before the pilgrims' arrival uh, were felled in, in this hurricane that, that didn't survive it. Church steeples, so iconically New England, uh, you know, many of them rebuilt, some of them probably still not rebuilt. And this was so powerful that new maps had to be drawn. It physically changed the landscape, uh, the physical landscape, not just the built landscape. So it changed the coastline so dramatically in some spots that they had to redraw maps to reconfigure uh, basically what, was, uh, what the new landscape looked like. So it was the New Deal, right? We're talking about during the war years here. This is really what made recovery possible. So two days after the hurricane hit, the Workers' Progress Administration began hiring all available men off of the relief rolls, right? I mean, I don't want to say anything good happens out of a disaster, but people were, went back to work. So uh, there was 11,000 civilian conservation corp workers cleared to help in the flooded areas. Uh, engineers were put back to work. Uh, federal writers projects created a pictorial history of the disaster. So people were out there working. Um, but with all this down trees, there was a huge risk of the lumber market being flooded as well. The economy is now going to suffer. So uh, the agencies created sawmills that could salvage the lumber and paid workers to clear debris as well and created uh, nurseries to help nourish new forests. They also brought lumber uh, above market prices to helping avert a timber crisis. So in addition to landscape, you can also imagine this had political implications. The so hurricane changed local and national politics in a lot of places. It showed, uh, I think overall, that the government existed not just to protect rights, but to help people in their greatest hour of need. Right? Unlike in previous catastrophes, New England and Long Island were rebuilt thanks to the federal government, not private citizens or organizations. In addition, changes took place at our friends at the National Weather Bureau, as you can imagine. So following the hurricane, uh, it continued to insist that it was blameless in this tra tragedy, that it was not their fault, telling the public that in the Northeast, nobody would have believed them if they said a hurricane was coming. Uh, that may be true, right, based on what we, we had said before, but there were certainly major ways in which the Weather Bureau could have helped and changes were uh, instituted. So they had a shakeup, as you can imagine. A Navy commander was appointed chief. A meteorologist from MIT was put on staff. Imagine that, right, a meteorologist on staff. And an order was given to start research and a training program for the people who worked there. So today, with aircraft that we have, radar, satellites, and a much better understanding of weather, there is little chance of the hurricane that of this magnitude could hit an entire region without warning, right? Still could hit, just that we would probably have a pretty good chance that something was coming. Then, that being said, as we started off, hurricanes are notoriously hard to predict. So even under the best circumstances, uh, they're very difficult to know where they're going to hit landfall within 100 miles or so. So how does this measure up to other storms? Well, here's some costs. And this slide is a little bit dated, but I think that the metrics still give you a pretty good idea. So if you look on the left, it's not one of the costliest hurricanes in terms of 2000, oh, this was done in 2010, in dollars. But when you adjust for inflation, and I think things would fall pretty much the same today, it's number seven in terms of the damage in terms of dollars that was done, which is a pretty high number. So um, the 1938 hurricane had much stronger winds, right? It was a category, uh, when you look at the comparison to some of these other hurricanes, um, it's amazing to see with less powerful winds the amount of damage Hurricane Sandy caused, right? If you're, anybody remembers Hurricane Sandy along New Jersey and New York. But it gives you a sense of what the uh, devastation of her, uh, the Hurricane of 38 would cause today. Uh, luckily, no other New England hurricane has killed and injured as many people as this. Uh, but the staggering amount of casualties, as well as the lethal element of surprise that we talked about, meant that it is unlikely any other hurricane will be able to compare with this storm. 
So the hurricane of 1938 is really a New England story, not just because it happened here, because it didn't get much coverage in other parts of the country. Uh, it started off, uh, or will end where we had started off with Hitler's invasion of Czechoslovakia overshadowed the disaster. Uh, a person stranded on a train in Worcester during the storm later said of the long hours on the train, and this is a quote, we missed having a radio. Most of us were wondering how the Czechs were making out. So they weren't even thinking about the hurricane. They were more concerned about the war. So it's sandwiched between the Great Depression and World War II and never really hit the national level of awareness like the Chicago fire or the San Francisco earthquake did even though the great hurricane caused more deaths than those two disasters combined. So looking back, one would say the hurricane marked the end of a point in time. And again, here's the quote for you. As one author put it, although few, if any, realized it at the time, 1938 would be the last of the old New England summers. The Yankee establishment had given way slowly. A sea of newness was washing over it. A new deal, a square deal, a new social compact. The political and social changing of the guard, the pace of life began to quicken. To those who lived to tell the tale, more than any other single event, the hurricane marked the beginning of modern times. What nature's storm began, the storms of war would complete, and gracious circumscribed way of life was lost forever. And I think that's true when we think about all those iconic scenes and, and the way that people were living in New England before or after this event. All right, so uh, I, I did not fully disclose that I am a trustee uh, of Historic Beverly, as well as my job at Historic New England. And our friends at Historic Beverly, uh, Abby Battis, our, the collections manager, was kind enough to give me a few images of Beverly that they have there. And I'm going to ask you all, because anybody know where this is? OK. See, I don't, I don't live in Beverly. So that's why I was, I'm glad that I figured that you would know where it is, right? This one might be a little harder to figure out unless somebody recognizes that house. But, but again, you know, can you imagine with a tree that size in Beverly, right, what it would have taken? And then here's a, th a third one with a big tree down. And I'm not sure if anybody recognizes where that is or not. But yeah. Yeah. Well, that house is likely standing still, right? So we might be able to pinpoint it. All right. Who has questions? And the other thing I'd encourage, too, if anybody has any stories they want to share, I always love to hear them. I know Faye had brought some pictures that I know when we're done, I think you're happy to share, right? Yeah. Um, I'm from Jamestown. Yeah. People were trapped on the ferries? Is that what happened? They were trapped on the island. On the island, OK. The island. Yeah. Couldn't get off. They couldn't get on. Right. Could everybody hear that? I can repeat it. So in Jamestown, there were ferries that basically got blown on the land, and people were landlocked, and nobody could get to them, so they were out without food for quite a while. Yeah. Yeah. I think the Cape Cod Canal bridges were built in uh, 1933 to 35. Were those damaged um, much during the? Yeah, you know, the, the question is, is if the Cape Cod bridges were damaged. We saw them in that one picture. Um, and maybe if I can go back to it, the bridge looked relatively intact. Uh, let's see. And what about the, uh, the railroad bridge? Went by it. I went by it. There we go. Yeah. So the bridge looks intact. I, I, I'm assuming it survived. And again, I think the Cape Cod Canal, as we said, might have helped that a little bit. I'm sorry, and someone else was saying? Um, the, the railroad bridge? The, the railroad bridge, yeah. Was that damaged? That I don't, I don't know. I don't know. But uh, you know, I, I know that you know, from what we've seen, the way that the storm hit, and with the Cape Cod Canal, this portion of Massachusetts didn't seem to get hit as badly as a lot of other areas. So yeah, somebody had a question back there, yeah. my research, I used this storm as a storm of record. And uh, 
what I noted was, we're due for a storm like this every hundred years. And the way that they can tell is in March is they look at the rack and they can carbon date it so they don't they can go back to pull historical records. So we're due for another one of these. Right. Within the next twelve years. <laughs> yeah. Right, if everybody didn't hear, right, that's, that's a 100-year cycle on these storms, so we're getting close to the dew point of them, yeah, and it, it makes sense, and right? how many people now live on the beach, have no historical memory of this, um, the, the damage would be immense. Yeah, and they, and they say that history repeats itself, right, because the same thing happened in 1938. Nobody had remembered the previous hurricanes before that, so I think you're exactly right. And at least now, we may, the, the human life may be better preserved because of the warning, right, at least that we have, but. And, and in the book I read, they said that two billion trees came down. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I would believe it. Yeah, do we have some me? Oh, you had a question. I saw a hand go up. I didn't see where. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm reiterating what Andy said. Why are we building in the Overlay District, putting high rises on the Bass River? That's another subject. Um, <laughs> my father was in Providence when the hurricane hit. He was in a hotel, and uh, he, he was an excellent swimmer. He had swum on his high school team, uh, and he went out into chest deep water to save a woman and drag her into the hotel. They had to be on the second floor. That's how deep the water was, and it got deeper. Um, and I had told you before that my father-in-law took pictures movies of the hurricane in Lawrence. And uh, it was interesting to see as this woman was standing in Beverly on a dress, on, in Rhode Island with a dress, all the women wore dresses. And it was depression and everybody had a wood stove. So in the movies, you see all these women in dresses and aprons out with axes trying to chop the trees that are on the roadway to clear the roads. And um, there's a picture of the Lawrence Dam. Um, and there's a tree, tree trunk about this big and who knows how long with big root system. And the water was so deep that that tree was able to float over the dam. Um, uh, and then my father-in-law that took the movie he used to deliver milk for hood milk with a horse and wagon. And so he went to the milk factory and he took pictures of, of course there was no electricity, so all the women were there doing the billing beside the windows where they could see to add up all their numbers. With their brain, no calculators or computers. But they were writing with ink as long as the sun shone, they were working. Um, very interesting yeah. movies, yeah. Yeah. Well, and you know, the stories are always so fascinating to me because I think it was in Stoneham, or I had done this lecture a couple years ago, and one woman was a young child, and she remembers her mother telling her, because her brother was outside somewhere, go get your brother. And she said, my mother sent me out into the hurricane, right? <laughs> no, they didn't know, right? It was a hurricane at the time, but she's like, looking back on it, my mother sent like a six-year-old child out into the hurricane to go find her brother. You know, but I just think that speaks to how people were so unaware, right, of exactly what was going to hit them. Yeah. I noticed that um, of your worst storms, you didn't mention the hurricane of '54. Oh, yeah. It wasn't on the list. It, it wasn't on the list. It so must. Yeah. It wasn't that bad, huh? It, it, double it, double it, it might not have been in terms of financial oh. dollars. Yeah, oh. that's why. That, but in terms of damage, it could have been, or in terms of. It hit Boston. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I do remember that one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, like, you know, and the, again, these stories are so broad, right? And we can, this is one kind of family's perspective, so to speak, on, on what they collected in that scrapbook, right? It all goes back to that scrapbook. But uh, as, as someone was, as the gentleman was saying, there's so many books written on this hurricane. You know, if anybody has further interest, I highly encourage. Uh, it's, it's really a fascinating. And, you know, we just touched on the politics and the economics of it, right? The physical damage is what this lecture focuses on. But uh, it, the repercussions economically, you know, the government changes were made in policy. It really had a large impact. Yeah? Who won the election for governor? <laughs> hey. uh, I don't know, Jonathan. Do you know? No, I don't know. <laughs> Curly I think. Curly, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think Curly, yeah, if I remember. 
Yeah. It's, it's not to do with the hurricane, but today is the, uh, I think the 80th anniversary of the fire in Boston. The, the, uh, the, the Coconut, Coconut Grove, Grove fire. fire. Yeah, the Coconut Grove fire. 80 years today. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and very recently, again, off topic, but uh, online, uh, I recently hosted with another speaker who was a more of an exponent than I did, the Great Boston Fire, right? It was the 100 year, 100 and, 150-year anniversary. It was November 9th, right, of the Great Boston Fire, too. So, yeah. This, this, this year? Yeah, it was just November 9th, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that's recorded, so if anybody wants to see that, you can find it online. But, uh, but I, hopefully when we leave here today, we're going on to non-disastrous things, right, to good things. So. Yeah, yeah. One other mention, if people are driving through Lowell, they should look across the, uh, the, the widest bridge there. There's a factory, and up on the, oh, around the third floor windows, or above the third floor windows, is a painted line that says water level of the 30th yeah. hurricane. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, all those. Wow. All those Merrimack River communities are terrible. There's one on the Merrimack. If you read by your bikes up there on the mm -hmm. back of the Merrimack, yep. near uh, Amesbury, yep. there's a barn that has a similar high line, water. high water mark. Yeah. 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 yeah, 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 I'm sure. It's yeah. Fascinating. Yes, sir. There's a line like that on Route 2, way out. Okay, yeah. And you drive by the side two and a half times up up the road. Yeah, you can imagine, right? So, well, thank you, everybody. I'm, it was a pleasure to be here. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I encourage you, uh, if, if, you know, if you want to take a quick peek at Faye's photos that she brought, they're family photos, which I always think is great because, again, you get that personal story. So thank you all.